everyone. Um, good evening for joining us on the session. Uh, I'm Aishwarya. Uh, I'm a technical specialist here at Altum Technologies. And um, I hope we can give you more information throughout the session. And so um, what we have right now is actually a series. And um, we will continue with this uh, over time. Just a second, I'm going to share my screen now. Yeah, so uh, like I told you, uh, this is a first, say, uh, which is 3D bioprinting and precision medicine. Um, I'm Aishwarya Shirur. I'm a technical specialist at Atom Technologies. And um, I'll start talking about us. So we are a patient platform company. And uh, we have been working with several platforms and several uh, 3D solutions, like the saw systems for CATIA, uh, MSC software for uh, you know computational fluid uh, dynamics, Stratasys for their plastic printers, which is FDM, Polyjet, SLA, and 3D printers. Then we have the RTEC 3D, which is for the 3D scanners. Um, following that, we have a life science segment, which is uh, which includes BioVia, which is a life science solution. It's a simulation suite. Um, consists of uh, sections like Discovery Studio, Mato, Pipeline Palette, etc. And then now I take you to the session which is Cellink, that is Life Sciences, and we work with 3D bioprinting. And uh, talking about us, we started sometime in 2011, and since then we have been establishing our foot and um, uh, going on, um, and we continue to grow. And as we continue to grow, we have uh, quite a large set of customers are continuously growing with time um, people from different sectors maybe education and research aero and defense um, automotive industry the healthcare industry consumer products um, and um, you know one of our focuses now in life sciences we also have quite a large portfolio of uh, life science clients from our end and now i'll come to the main part which is uh, what is 3d bioprinting precision medicine and how do we lead to it what are the challenges that we face in life sciences? So when you talk about life sciences is actually um, several problems out of which the main focus for us is the lack of organ transplants. So although there are who are in severe need of organs, not getting enough donors, we are not um, able to find a proper match. Uh, among this is the reason where um, we are facing quite a lot of shortage, and we think there is an issue here. And uh, we see there is a waste due to wrong testing methods. That is, um, whatever tests that we do of a drug is usually due to, um, you know, any sort of, is due to any sort of uh, drugs which has been put and uh, that causing a lot of testing problems. So we are, we are 3D structures, we are 3D in nature and then over that, uh, most of the testing platforms are 2D. Following this, we again have the lab to shelf time. Again, when you talk about the lab to shelf time, uh, we know that uh, whatever drug that comes out takes up longer to come out as product as, as a producible um, good or a, or a consumable in the market. And that's where we are trying to, or we in general, the technology of life sciences or biotech is trying towards making these or bridging these gaps together. So now coming to what is tissue engineering, right? Uh, tissue engineering is an interdisciplinary field. So the whole idea behind uh, this concept of us creating artificial models that also in terms of um, humans, right? We are, we are trying to make it more human friendly uh, function and form and fit functional so that's where we have tissue engineering as a main basis and it's a field which applies the principle of engineering and life sciences towards the development of maybe biological substitutes that restore maintain the tissue functions so when you talk about uh, bioprinting as such or when you talk about engineering which holds the main idea of uh, we know that it is one constituent uh, interdisciplinary field consisting of various um, various portfolios or other various sections which to create tissue engineering as a platform. 
So when you talk about issue engineering, you're having scaffolds, which are quite important. Following scaffolds, the cells which we use, so you use the cell type. And then we have our chemical and physical factors. When we have scaffolds for the sugar availability, the cell attached, uh, and migration. And then you have the mechanical properties. So when you talk about the cell type, you would go with the selection of the cell type. Uh, what is the relevant cell model that you want to use? What is the kind of interaction your cells will have among each other? Signal pathway, the integration of flow. So when you look at tissue as a whole, it's, it consists of a major constituent of many different fields together or many areas put together. And uh, that's where it's called as a, a field of biomedical, right? Um, and when you talk of tissue engineering, we have already gone with the scaffolds, we've gone with it, and now talking about the chemical and physical factors, which is a very, very important thing here. So example, you have your nutrient means, you have uh, the environment, you have the humidity, you have the, we need to have the right amount of uh, concentration of nutrition, the cells so these are all quite dependent on each field so we come down to what is 3d bioprinting right so um that uses cells and other biocompatible materials so you're going to use these biocompatible materials to print living structures and the idea is to create something layer by layer so you want to mimic a structure a living structure and how this happens is when it goes layer by layer so that's you have the main idea behind 3D by 3D printing itself. So if you've noticed, um, it's quite trending right now that you see 3D printed models uh, with a lot of customization and uh, um, quite just being put up. So using that as a technology and in integrating this along with tissue engineering is what forms 3D bioprinting, right? So uh, the whole constituent of 3D bioprinting, if you have to see, is actually cells, bio inks, and then you have culture media. When you talk of cells, uh, we would go with obviously the obviously selecting the type of cells. So when you're selecting the cells, it is going to be application specific. Then we have culture media, which is the whole bio or the biological aspect of your bioprinting. And then you have the main. So this bio ink is what creates what we call as scaffolds. Bio inks are uh, gels which are optimized in such a manner that they can be easily in such a way that if you print it you also have your cells in it. the cells have to survive while the printing process happens and once the printing has happened there should be some amount of mechanical strength so if there is a mechanical strength in this model then you would say that your uh, bio model is quite uh, confluent or the cells are quite confluent you have a better cell viability and this greater structure so from here now we uh, what 3d bioprinting exactly is 3d bioprinting by a beer Signal with the new and lab at unc chapel hill we print things all the time whether they're documents posters or flyers printing is an important technology in our daily lives Relatively recently, however, printing took a big step forward with 3D printing. We could build a 3D model on the computer, send it to the printer, and we could have the object in our hands in hardly any time. What if I told you that this isn't the limit? There is more to explore. What if we could print living things made up of cells? We can make blood vessels, tissues, and organs. We can help the hundreds of thousands of people waiting on transplant lists. This idea is not too far from reality if we use 3D bioprinting. 3D bioprinting is just like normal 3D printing, except it uses living cells as ink to create living structures. Like 3D printing, you have to create a model on a computer, then layer by layer, your living structure will be printed.
The first step in the process is known as pre-bioprinting. Here, the desired product is determined and studied. Oftentimes, 3D scans, such as CT scans or MRI images, are taken of the desired product and are then converted into a series of 2D images to serve as a template for the different layers. Cells are then isolated and extracted from an organism, which is often the recipient of the product, in order to create bioink. Bioink is one of the most important parts of the 3D bioprinting process. It starts with the cells that were extracted. Then, molecules called hydrogels are added to provide water for the cells. Other nutrients and chemicals are added so that the cells can grow and communicate as if they were in a living body. Once the BioInc is developed, we reach the step of doing the actual printing. Using the BioInc, our organ is printed layer by layer until we achieve our final product. There's not just one method of bioprinting. Different types include inkjet printing, acoustic printing, and laser printing. The most common type of bioprinting, however, is extrusion printing. This method is probably how you would normally think of 3D printing. The bioink is loaded into a printing chamber and is pushed out around nozzle. The nozzle produces a tiny filament that is often around 400 microns in diameter, or about the thickness of four pieces of paper. Once you've finished the physical bioprinting portion, the final step is solidification. In general, Bioink is a viscous liquid, so in order for it to become the desired product, it needs to harden. Sometimes, the Bioink will solidify on its own. Other times, the process of cross-linking will occur with the aid of things like exposure to UV light, physical changes like heating or cooling, or chemical changes due to the addition of certain compounds. In a way, 3D bioprinting is very similar to making a cake. First, you have to pre-bioprint. Similar to the medical scans that are used, you have to use a recipe to model your cake after. Instead of using bioink made of cells, hydrogels, and other chemicals, you make a cake batter with eggs, flour, sugar, and other ingredients. Then, you create your cake layer by layer, until they all come together, just like when 3D printing. Finally, the solidification process is like putting your cake in the oven and letting it harden to achieve the desired product. As the technology of 3D bioprinting continues to be developed, more and more advances are made. Currently, we aren't quite able to produce entire organs due to the complexities of the tissue. But there have still been uses of 3D bioprinting. For example, a tracheal splint was created for an infant with TBM and bladders have been constructed for those with end-stage bladder disease. In fact, a rabbit-sized heart was even created in 2019. Other applications of bioprinting can be creating artificial organs, bone tissue regeneration, aiding in cosmetic surgery, and producing living tissue that can be used for pharmaceutical testing without the risk of harming a test subject. In fact, 3D bioprinting is being used to create drug delivery systems that respond to stimuli such as pH, temperature, and light. Thank you for watching. So, uh, I think we were able to understand that uh, 3D bioprinting is, is like baking a cake. Uh, that's what uh, is the general criteria about it. But it's way, way complex in that. Um, we would be using cells. We would be using our, uh, you know, CAD models. We would be using our uh, bioinks or the biomaterials. And all of these put together is what is going to create the main structure that you want. So, uh, with the bioprinting itself, I'm going to talk about the types of bioprinters and also 
what is the steps that are involved in bioprinting so the types of bioprinters are extrusion printing where is where it is pressure resisted filament dependent where you can create multiple models at once and you can use multiple materials on the other hand we have the light that is digital light processing so here it is a light assisted printing where which is filament independent consists of high resolution it's watertight and it has limited material usage right so when you talk of extrusion based printing it works like this on the other hand when we talk about digital light processing so this helps us create more watertight models so it's used in applications like microfluidics organ on a chip and this is where it can most efficiently be used so there are definitely other types of uh, printing techniques like inkjet printing or laser jetting uh, process but extrusion and digital light processing are two methods which are most widely used so the steps involved in bioprinting you would start with imaging wherein you would either take the mri the ct or even a 3d scan of the structure that you want to replicate then you are going to convert that dicom format into a 3d model so these are 2d slices converted into 3d slices and once the 3d slices are formed we would then take it to the next step where we would uh, process it right so you would process it and you would you would convert your files which is in the stl format to something called a g code so you are giving a communicative language where a normal simple cad model is now converted into several slices to be printed by the printer since it works by additive manufacturing it goes by a bottom top approach step 3 being material so in material selection you would go with maybe synthetic polymers or natural polymers and this is a very crucial part honestly because selecting the right kind of biomaterial which is a bio ink or a hydrogel along with it having a certain amount of mechanical strength um having a certain um, texture having viscosity the rheological properties and the impact of these materials on the cells is quite quite crucial so the selection happens on one side we also have our cell selection cell selection would be maybe using differentiated or pluripotent cells or multipotent cells so you can select the cells based on your application following this you would go to the step of bioprinting So here you can select maybe extrusion based printing or you would use DLP printing or inkjet or laser assisted. Once the printing is done, you would go to a process which is called post processing. That is either you will cure it, uh, that is solidifying the hydrogel, uh, you know, converting it in from a slightly more semi liquid form to a slightly more semi solid, so sort a of gelation form. And from there you have your step six. where you take care of the application that is whether you want to do in vitro testing or you plan to implant it or you want to see how it grows and study the tissue models that's where this is used so the advantages of bioprinting we are quite aware of scaffolds being made quite easily uh, with our consistent methods that we have um say maybe the conventional methods of electro spinning or solvent leaching method or uh, any other basic form of method there are this quite a long list of methods that way um when you look at these methods we have a set of maybe um disadvantages that come in that is maybe they take a lot of time they're quite costly um there is uneven distribution of cells when we use this the reproducibility is affected and this main fails to replicate the geometry we are looking at a specific geometry that leads to be a lot of calculation while creating a scaffold you wanting to put that in picture or practically trying to print it is always the hard part so when you use bioprinting as a method you will always have a set of advantages over these conventional methods that is increasing the structural flexibility i will be able to create 
um, structures with quite a lot of details quite easily when I use bioprinting. Uh, then there's a, there's a high amount of spatial control because you're programming a whole machine to move in a certain pattern to create whatever design you want. Next is the large scale fabrication. You can always create multiple at, well, at once, maybe through multi-well plates, etc. Then you have automation, right? Since this is an automatic system, the time duration, the cost that is spent on it is way lesser than the conventional method. So the applications of bioprinting. When you talk of the applications of bioprinting, we have soft robotics, which is a, which is a method or, or a, a place where uh, we try to convert more solidic metallic robots into something more soft. And having to create those easily um, is obviously aided by our 3D printing or 3D bioprinting techniques. So with soft robotics, you can also integrate something called biohybrid uh, robots. And this is, a, you know, this is an integration of um, bringing the biological systems along with a soft robotics concept put together to create quite realistic mimicking structures. Next comes our 3D cell culture. So as we all know that we are 3D informed. Um, whatever cells that we grow in petri dishes are always in 2D and uh, we are trying to now go to a different stage. So creating a more 3D cell culture platform is where 3D bioprinting can help you set that scaffold structure to easily allow the growth, to understand the interaction of the cells with each other, to understand what is the kind of um, cell signaling that happens is quite crucial and the application fits right where you need to study more diseases to study more tissue models. Okay. <clears throat> so next is biomaterial development. In the biomaterial development, we have uh, using bio inks, using uh, materials which are, um, which are compliant, which can be easily flown to create models. So when you use these biomaterials, uh, you can create uh, several types, several viscous models that can easily come out. From biomaterial development, the next step is organ on a chip. So with organ on a chip, it's it's a quite fascinating sector in in the in the field of healthcare and life sciences. Uh, fact being that we are trying to optimize, we are trying to minimize our whole lab space to something as small as a chip, making it easier for. Uh, testing of drugs, making it easier for us to understand, uh, you know, what sort of um, functions, what sort of physiological aspects are relevant when it comes to an organ on a chip. So when you talk of an organ on a chip, you would say testing a drug, testing an interaction of a cell, uh, testing the interaction of a drug with the several organs in one place, right? So this is where a chip can really help. And uh, there's, a, there's quite a lot of incorporation of microfluidics here in order to um, understand uh, to what extent the cells are growing, to what extent your drug is being affected. Next is tissue models. And this is actually the initial idea of uh, bringing in bioprinting because being able to replicate a certain anatomy with compliant materials, with cells, uh, being able to replace any uh, damaged part with a engineered part is, is the whole idea of bioprinting initially. So while it is serving one purpose of tissue models, it is also serving multiple um, multiple application sectors because of the factor that it's helping create better geometry. You're using more natural and more um, compliant materials and more compatible materials. The next point being drug discovery. So in drug discovery, you have maybe high throughput screening of drugs. You want to test your drugs on a specific platform. That's where you will have drug discovery. And from there, you also have drug delivery. So drug delivery is a sector where you can easily create any sort of geometry to see the release of a drug at a specific site. So through our various sessions in the future, you will be able to see little more in depth in each of these sectors. So this session is actually an introduction, um, making you understand what bioprinting is for the people who have 
who are attending the session these are sessions for the first time and from here you will be able to progress towards seeing what biomaterial development exactly is what 3d cell culture is what organ on a chip is uh, what are the steps what are the measures how do we actually do bioprinting so these are the kind of uh, processes we will see in the further sessions so this uh, this is a example a case which we would give about 3d bioprinting and this has been easily quite efficiently used in corneal stroma equivalence so if you're having a case of um, a corneal damage and you're trying to look at a replacement looking at something that would heal and create a tissue for you cornea would be the simplest to start with and as you start with the simpler models you can always um, go on growing and going to the next steps steps where you can create complex models so uh, in this they have started with say a digital model of a cornea which is again obtained from a 3d printing code again you have a scanned section of a person's eye you would have uh, taken a proper imaging of the eye model from that you would convert it into a 2d 2D slice model from the 2D slice it would turn into a 3D space following that again it converts into a top down approach of slicing the image once the image is sliced that's when the machine is now ready ready being having the material that you want the cells that you want ready as well as the uh, bio ink that you want so the bio materials and cells are combined together in order to form bio ink right so the bio ink once it's loaded into the 3D printing cartridge it will go on doing a process so as you do the printing you will have again the post processing stage um, this takes place under maybe controlled physiological conditions it's obvious that when you are dealing with cells it is important to have a um, aseptic environment so a clean chamber facility uh, uh, you know a wet lab facility would be quite essential when you are dealing only with cells right if it's without cells you can easily create something try to sterilize it and then use it later on so um, this is a case wherein they have created cornea and they've been able to see quite a lot of cell viability with, through tests saying that okay this is a viable model and it lasts from say uh, having tests done from day 7 to day 14 to day 21 and so on and so forth and um, obviously now it's a phase wherein everything is under in vitro testing followed by animal testing and once the animal testing is done is where the clinical trial process would come into picture so uh, right now most of the models that people are creating especially researchers out there are more specific to getting a successful printed model followed by creating um, you know uh, creating and having a positive impact on animal models um, and if not animal models and if it is something that is not coming in direct contact with your system that might cause any sort of toxicity you can always uh, bypass a few methods to further improve your research next is heart tissue models when you talk about heart tissue model here we have uh, gone with a basic blueprint a basic design of the heart um, use materials called uh, cell link laminink um, along with IPSC cells they are all mixed together put together Together using our bio x printer you get more details on this um, as you as we progress into the session we printed it we incubated it and after 21 days we would notice that the cells are quite confluent quite viable and you will see that there is this glow that is basically the influx and outflux of calcium ions making us understand that yes they are capable of being of creating any sort of um, el electronic, uh, you know, um, any sort of conductions of uh, energy within the within the body. So this sort of positive outcome can really help us uh, understand and see how tissues work, how we can progress from making a single patch to maybe a whole organ. So that's how um, we are progressing with with this field. It's a field which is quite a lot in. Uh, in the research phase it's it's a field which is progressing from our base sheet models to maybe a whole organ right so um next is an example of um biomaterial development followed by integration of quite a lot of things so biomaterial development would mean 
using any sort of biomaterial a hydrogen which is available naturally examples would be gelatin alginate so these are all sourced so for example when we talk about alginate it's taken from uh, seeds it's taken from sea algae right when you talk of gelatin it's taken from bone so these are natural structures which have to be optimized entirely in such a manner that they do not cause any sort of toxicity while they aid the growth of cells and also create a specific geometry with that mechanical strength so here they have created a, a hydroxyapatite slurry and with that hydroxy hydroxyapatite slurry they have tried to see what are the various strengths or the what are the various factors that can influence towards creating the best model so they have gone with 50% infill 75% infill 100% infill and would we'll see what is the best method or what is the best infill so when you talk about infill infill is actually filling a specific solid structure right or filling a, a box to see if you want to fill that you can fill it either with alternate lines or you can just fill it one by one right this depends and this is a factor to consider when you have to do bioprinting so uh, here they have uh, actually taken a real model and this is done somewhere in iit uh, iit hyderabad along with collaborations uh, with universities abroad and um, here they have taken a patient ct scan they have done the segmentation of the image and they have reconstructed that image to see how we can replace to form a graft so we are trying to create a bony graft like structure at a site um, for a person's wrist so to go through that process you will actually go with starting with taking an image converting that image into segments understanding what can fill the gap between the broken bones understanding that okay this is the kind of graft quality you would use and then following that you would go with uh you would go with maybe uh creating the grafts so you would go through using softwares like mimix you would go through using uh, you know cad models like catia etc and uh, then you would convert them and um, create plastic models you can use a 3d printer create a dummy model something called pre surgical modeling is being used here you do the pre surgical modeling and as a pre surgical modeling happens you would see okay if i have taken a graft of this particular size on a plastic printed model for my pre surgical modeling what is the kind of time i would use to do it on a natural patient so doing that analysis over there then it becomes easier to incorporate bioprinting itself because now you have saved the time there is less amount of uh, surgical uh, you know fatalities and would have successfully grafted the bony structure so this would easily um, help in creating customizable grafts so if you if you know or if you've noticed um, whatever models we have in the hospitals right now they are all forms in in the forms of beads in the forms of um, custom or in the forms of any standard sizes so having to customize them for specific patient takes up quite a lot of time and energy and we're not sure to what extent it is going to help so we need to do the set of analysis where we would create something which is exactly in form and fit and same dimensions as a as the client to use it on them and then to see what sort of growth is happening so this has been a successful case and uh, you will see that there has been quite amount of osteo induction that has happened allowing the growth of the of the bones and also to see that there is a good amount of graft material at the site so with soft robotics like i told you uh, the applications are quite diverse something as simple as creating a biomimicking organ is can be easily done you would create uh, materials which are compliant you would create a basic uh, arm or you would create any basic prosthetic so using certain soft materials and creating um, miniature geometries versus creating larger geometries are also quite a good um, idea in terms of um, using printing we using say maybe 3d bioprinting or 3d printing itself
This is another case which is related to drug delivery where you have done the fabrication of 3D printed fish gelatin based polymer hydrogel. So here you're using patches and you're trying to study what is the best um, area that can be ordered to allow the release of drug. Right, so uh, here they have used doxorubicin. Uh, doxorubicin in itself is um, is a good medicine, but and as an anti-cancer medicine, but there are also quite a lot of side effects. So to avoid the side effects, to allow sustainable release with less amount of side effects, they design drugs. Right, so here they have used F gelma along with CMC, that is carboxy methyl cellulose sodium, and they have now printed it in various shapes, say cylinder, say torus or grid lines. Once you have done that, uh, they would try to understand the concentration of the hydrogen. What is the swelling behavior? Whenever a hydrogel, when you talk about hydrogels, they are materials that love water. They are quite, uh, they can be easily swollen when it comes to having water because it can absorb and retain so much amount of water. So based on the interaction with the solvent, you would see maybe the cross-linking density, the hydrophilicity, and few other factors, wherein you would understand comparing these three models at which is the best. So upon comparison, upon studies of drug release about zones of inhibition, etc., they understood that the torus structure would have a greater amount of uh, drug release when you compare it to maybe a grid line or a cylinder. Right? So grid line would be a normal structure, then you have a cylinder, and then you have a torus. So with this, you're able to compare what kind of medication can be used when it comes to drug delivery. You can understand what structure is used, is, is easy when it comes to targeted delivery. When you're looking at any sort of disease, we would want to, say example, wound healing, right? Any wound healing or any ulcer or anything. We do know that there's quite a lot of struggle when it comes to um, matching or um, so Having designed models of what works best when it comes to any simple wound, any deep wound, then we are able to really progress in such a way that we can design more smart drug delivery systems. Um, next example is of DLP printing. Uh, DLP printing is actually digital light processing bioprinting. And uh, here you would use layers, slices of light uh, that will cure a material. Curing means solidifying something, right? So you'd use these materials and create models. So this example is actually bioprinting the heart model. Here you're creating a patient-derived model. So once you have a patient-derived model, you are going to convert it into a 3D model, which is with the help of bioprinting. So the example here is quite critical and quite important because here they have used... Um, a day 22 embryonic heart. Uh, again, these images are attained through uh, MRIs and ultrasounds, and you would you would section them and you would see exactly that what are the what is the kind of uh, development. So uh, this study is actually meant to understand the growth of a heart in a fetal heart or an embryonic heart. So maybe there is a tube formation, maybe there is a, a ventricular formation. So here they would see the left ventricle formation and there they would see the tubular formation in, in terms of embryonic and fetal heart respectively. So uh, they have done the studies, they have tried to create the CAD models and they have created models in such a way that eventually they would seed cells into it. They would seed uh, epithelial cells and they would take care of the microfluidics, basically the perfusion of the system. When you perfuse the system, you'll be able to understand what is the contributing factors to any sort of congenital diseases or any growth related issues. So um, having this fluidic perfusion studies, heart construct studies, and then analyzing them to understand the proper development of heart in maybe embryos of fetus will, um, Ill, will at least to one extent eradicate um, certain problems, congenital issues, or even give us a certain solution to to existing diseases. So there are so many diseases coming up and we don't know the causes in order for us to create or create a drug or create a solution for the problem. So having pre-surgical models, having bioprinted models can really simplify 
um, learning or analyzing any sort of pro any congenital or any cell related uh, patients. So uh, now I'll take you to precision medicine, which is um, again a area of application where bioprinting is really useful. When you talk of precision medicine, precision medicine is actually defined as individualized diagnosis and treatment utilizing strategies for targeting patients or diseases. So here you are going to be specific in terms of finding a, finding a medication or finding a drug. Whatever drugs we have right now are all drugs which are standard drugs. They're general drugs, right? Counter drugs. But when you have specific issues, specific problems, you need to also create specific medications. That's why precision medicine is something which is a complex and rather interesting area. So uh, here you would use, uh, you will definitely try to check the genetic, the proteomic as well as the phenotypical typical characteristics These characteristics they will try to um, create models once the models are created they will try to study the model to create a drug so one of or several of the examples where precision medicine can come in is using or trying to create bio biomaterials these are personalized right they can be specific to the fit of an individual uh, specific to the shape of an individual then you have personalized devices. You have small devices or smart devices which can be fit um, when it comes to uh, any any disease, any uh, healthcare healthcare issue. Then you have personalized cells. Personalized cells are again a whole different line because here you you bring in genetics, you bring in proteomics, you bring a lot of genetical factors into picture while you are doing the study. And personalized models is where you use these cells and then you create it. So traditionally, you would have, have maybe the, uh, you know, finding the faulty gene in the individual or finding the gene itself of the person to create the drug. So when you're using biofabrication as a method, you are going to basically screen your drugs against something which is specific to that person's condition or the genetic makeup. So uh, finding the optimizer or identifying the right drug for that patient is where you're going to use bioprinting, biofabrication itself. And um, with progress of, you know, progress of bioprinting itself, um, it, it, its idea again is quite close to drug discovery and drug uh, toxicity screening. So the pharmaceutical impact versus the, you know, how bioprinting is helping it is quite substantial is growing with time. Um, so you have simple printed 3D models for maybe initial validation of drug hits. Um, this is again specific, right? This is for drug discovery. Next comes to complex multicellular disease models where you use 3D hydrogel based models for determining the drug treatment efficacy. So when you have to take a specific disease and you need a disease group to test it on, um, you would rather go with any disease model to replace a disease group, a, a human, a, a person. So uh, 3D bioprinted models that way can really help in disease modeling. Following again, toxicity screening, which is a very simple and very direct area where bioprinting can come into picture. You can easily test the drugs. You can see the impact of any drug on maybe the liver, the heart, um, or any other parts of your body through maybe microfluidic chips or even 3D printed models. Next is where again, precision medicine comes in. So here you're printing patient specific cells for diagnosing diseases and you're understanding and treating any specific um, section. So uh, this session gives you quite um, a superficial or even in-depth understanding of 3D bioprinting. And uh, we will keep progressing with time to see and to understand um, how, where, what are the cases, what are the realistic um, solutions and the realistic cases that has happened when it came to bioprinting. Um, now I'll just tell you about us, Cellink. So Cellink is actually a Sweden-based company and uh, they have quite a large um, base of customers in India and globally. And uh, we have a wide range or a wide set of uh, machines on our end. One is the Incredible Plus, the Incredible. Then we have the BioX, BioX series. 
we have the bio mdx uh, bio mdx plus and the luminex so uh, they are all they are all set in a manner that um, with each level of complexity you can progress with each machine so uh, these three sets which are the incredible series the bio bios x series and the bio mdx series they are meant for extrusion based printing um, they are also meant for droplet printing syringe pump printing and multiple other things you will understand the details as you come and visit our website and uh, see uh, you know what is the portfolio of our products what is the kind of uh, cases what are the real realistic challenges what are the realistic um, outcomes of using bioprinting as a technology and then we have luminex which is a dlp based printing so this is an entirely different uh, type of bioprinter which is uh, used widely with our existing uh, methods of bioprinting where they are trying to do mi microfluidic models we are trying to do organo chip models and even creating any complex tissue structures so um, when you talk of bioprinting um, it's new as a field um, it is in its research phase so you will have um, you know you will have limited yet also complex models that have been created with time and um, fact being that uh, right now it coming to india is also another addition to um, research and that's why now we have center of excellences uh, trying to get into the field of bioprinting in order to um, in order to you know eradicate the challenges that we have conventionally when it comes to drug development when it comes to organ transplants or even creating a product that comes out in the market quickly uh, we also have our other solution which is the biovia it is it is a you know a discovery student from the soil systems and this is entirely a bioinformatic platform for simulations and in silico modeling uh, the capabilities are maybe protein engineering Anti antibody modeling, simulations, uh, X-ray analysis, etc., and uh, they have a large portfolio, maybe in uh, bioinformatics, cheminformatics, say hom homology modeling, genomics, um, and it's quite in depth in in allowing us to understand the ADME studies. Uh, so this is like a this biovia is like in silico studies. Following biovia, we have. Uh, in vitro studies. So, in vitro studies is where bioprinting comes into picture. So, um, thank you so much for joining us on this session and uh, please follow us on um, all of the social media handles that we are available in. Uh, that is Altum Technologies Private Limited. And, uh, and also I'd like to tell you that uh, we have a Q&A session tomorrow at 7 p.m. This is in along with Biotechnica and uh, so this is in regards to our previous session that we had along with Biotechnica where uh, we had a series of sessions following different applications in bioprinting and uh, we would like to you know um, uh, let all of you come there in order to uh, allow us answer all of these questions that have been posted by a lot of people previously. And uh, I hope you like the session. Now we'll be taking some questions. One second. Okay. So. One second. I'll be just randomly picking few questions as I see them. Uh, in case I'm not able to address them, we can you can definitely directly contact us to get the answers of those. Okay, so this question is from Parul. I'm interested to know about the software part, designing the model, file conversion, etc. as my background is not the same. So uh, we will definitely have sessions in future where you will be able to understand how do we create these models. Uh, so from our end, what we have as our product portfolio, uh, we would use designing softwares like CATIA to create a 3D model. Uh, then we would use a slicing software which is called um, Cellink Hardware which is uh, which is actually slice 3r which will hel help us create slices of those models so uh, you can 
definitely um, check our other products and our other uh, webinars that we have related to design models. So this will help you quite a lot, Parul. I hope this answers your question. Um, the next one would be, yes. So this question is, how do we design the graph at the very start point of the whole process? So um, see, first thing is you will always use imaging techniques to acquire the data. Say you will use X-rays or you will use MRIs, etc. Using that, you are going to end up, uh, you know, finding that finding the dimensions. You are going to use softwares, computational softwares, to understand what is the graph dimension, what is the graph stability, what is the distance between the two broken parts. Right? This X-ray analysis is going to help with that, and then you are going to design the model. So, uh, like I already answered the answered the question for Parul, you would follow it with the with the pre for with the next section. Right. So uh, this design part is not a very simple part. You will definitely have to go to go through quite some analysis and uh, reading. So next question is. OK, so. Um, the question here is, in the case of artificial transplantation and 3D printing, will there be any immune reaction after the transplantation? So as we all know that when it comes to normal transplantation, we have a donor and uh, we would use a donor's um, organ, use it on another patient, right? So there is definitely immunological responses. But when you're trying to use 3D bioprinting, end of the day, we are always trying to use the patient's own cell. That is the end goal. Right now, the goal is to create a model which is sustainable and then creating something. So that way, immune rejection is something that can be completely or even partially eradicated to an extent that a person's lifespan can be improved. Um, the complexity of bioprinting itself is, is, uh, is quite vast. And we are all in the initial state of coming or you know trying to progress with it to create a final model. Okay, um, so yeah, Vidhi Mathur, uh, you can directly contact us for support. I see a question um, about using the machine. So we would love for you to contact us and we'll be helping you out um, over that. I'll just see if there are some more questions I can find. Okay. All right, then. Um, yeah, so the question here I see is how 3D bio printing is used in precision medicine, right? Uh, precision medicine is finding something specific to a patient, right? If I have a person's cell or if I have any disease, any specific disease or maybe even cancer to a larger extent, uh, I will be able to study that person's genetic component, genetic composition, create a model for that person so that I can discover a drug, right? I can't directly test it on a large set of people. You know the process of clinical trials where you go through four phases and it takes years. So um, the idea here is to create something very specific to the, to the uh, diseased and to quickly find a drug for that problem. So that's where 3D printing will help in precision medicine. I hope this answers your question, Purvi. Um, so yeah, we are coming to the end of this session. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and we will definitely um, help out and you can easily reach out uh, for any issues. You can visit us on Altum Technologies for more information. Um, and I hope this session was uh, fruitful for everyone and um, have a nice have a nice evening